Sean, come on up. Uh, Sean Lehman grew up at the church here, so where should we begin? Uh, Sean's the son of Tim and Brenda Lehman. Uh, you remember them. And, of course, uh, his grandma and grandpa were Bill and Bobby Davis. And so that kind of lets you see uh, the path that he took getting here. Uh, he graduated from Oklahoma Christian. What was your degree in? Youth and Family Ministry. Youth and Family Ministry, which is exactly what he's doing. He did get to spend about three years working at Oklahoma Christian as a resident director. Director. So you directed the residents. Yes, exactly. They needed directing. <laughs> and how long have you been at Crosstown? For a year. For one year. Mm -hmm. You're married to Alyssa. Mm -hmm. And Alyssa was here as our intern one summer. And you guys might remember that. And so that's awesome. And she's from Bixby, is that correct? So uh, that's awesome. Let's pray. And then we'll turn it over to Sean. And you'll have our invitation. And then we'll have a invitation song, uh, 909, if you want to turn there. But let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Sean. Thank you so much for his love for you and his love for our young people. We ask that uh, the study that he has made, that he will, he will bring uh, your word alive to us, uh, not just so that we can hear it and our ears uh, can be excited, but because our life will be different, because we paid attention to the words br brought to us tonight. Father, thank you for his family and the heritage that he has and for his ability, and that uh, he's using his ability in full-time service uh, in your kingdom. Father, we thank you for the Crosstown Church and for the trust that they've placed in him. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, okay. Hello. I hope you're all doing good. Um, it's been a long time since I've been up here. Uh, last time I was up here, I was given three-minute little devotional talks, and it definitely didn't look this good in here. <laughs> um, well, as many of you know, I grew up here. This congregation has a really special place uh, in my heart. Um, growing up, all my best friends were here. Uh, in the youth group. All my additional parents are here, you know, on top of my set of parents, the Keels, the Walvards, the Maynards. Um, so it's always really great to be able to be with you guys. Um, and of course, the youth group was a big, big influence on me. And Richard and Mike were, were big reasons why I decided to go into youth ministry myself. Um, so if I remember correctly, the summer series that we we're doing is called All In becoming a more committed disciple of Christ. Um, so with that today, I was, I was kind of asked to, to address the teens, but really I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address, I'm still going to address all of you uh, together. So uh, like Scott said, I worked three years um, before being at Crosstown at the Oklahoma Christian University. I was a resident director which is really just a glorified name for a dorm dad. So it's not that prestigious of a title. Um, doing that, I saw a lot of crazy things. I was over freshman guys for two years, so a lot of uh, crazy stuff happens while you're trying to keep track and keep them all in line. But uh, so like I said, resident director, uh, I worked with you know, kids just out of high school, coming into college, freshman year, their first real taste of independence. And I saw a pretty negative factor a lot of times coming out of that. Um, and when, I, when we're talking about discipleship, um, so for the first few years, like I said, I worked with freshman boys. Um, and a lot of times when they would come, you would see these kids that were very, very strong in their faith, uh, very committed to the youth groups, and you would see this slide in their discipleship towards God. Whether it was falling away from the church or kind of taking a hiatus from church, you would see this slide, and sadly it even happens, of course, on Christian campuses as well. So one of the biggest things that I found out I needed to do as a resident director was teach these young men a very crazy idea and that is one word and that's called responsibility they <laughs> had no idea what taking responsibility was about and i'm speaking of course in generalities not everybody was like this but a big big part of them were um, 
But this, this responsibility, it's not just in our, it's not just teens, it's not just kids going into high school. A lot of people struggle with this fact of responsibility and accepting and taking ownership of ourselves. So they don't, what I, what I found a lot of times is this lack of responsibility began to make itself manifest in their spiritual walk with God. So I believe that in many times this boils down, um, in youth and family ministry, we, we kind of talk about two different types of faith. And you can see this when these kids also go to college. And that is the parents' faith and their own faith. And you see this within every single kid, both, both types of faith. And like I said, you can see it in every single teen, you can see it in college kids, and you can see it even farther above that many times. Now, when I say parents' faith, I don't mean that in a bad way, when you see this in a, in a, in a kid um, or a college student. This means, uh, well, I'll backtrack a little bit, a parent's faith in, a, in one of our teens is a very, very pivotal and important thing. And it is something that is, is really important for their walk with Christ. This type of faith is, is the starting point for them. It's where it all begins. Uh, these are the building blocks to their faith, to where they're going. So. We know teens start, of course, learning from their parents as children. Uh, and they use that as they progress within their lives. So we know that parents teach their kids what their parents usually taught them and what they learned additionally in their walk with God. So this form of, of teens' faith, like I said, is absolutely pivotal to the growth of every Christian whether it be good or bad, you know, you can have good and bad experiences with all these things. Um, so that's a p very pivotal point to, to moving on with their walk with God. Um, and of course, no two parents' teachings are exactly 100% the same or the way they teach. So you see different factors coming in to a lot of these kids' walks with God. But like many things we see in this life, this form of faith for teens, is not, it's, it's good to start. It's not necessarily good to always have that same level of faith. It's good for an extended period of time. So this is, like I said, the building blocks to the faith that our teens or that college, young college students have or even new Christians, and it, but it only gets them so far. This is where the second type of faith comes in, and is really pivotal, uh, and that is their own faith. They have learned from their parents, they have learned from their teachers, they have learned from ministers. Now it's time for them to learn and really know what they believe for themselves. Through reading, through study, through life experience, we begin to grow in our own belief system on top of what we had previously learned from our parents' faith. This is where it usually begin to see application of scripture. We begin to see uh, people or, or teens really be able to explain what they believe, defend their beliefs, and really see their, their joy or their commitment to Christ and knowing that he died on the cross for their sins. So there are these two types of faith, like I said, parents' faith and our own faith that we see in all teens. And I found that in my experience of going also being a resident director in college, that if they do not begin to work on their own belief for themselves and only stick with that initial belief they had and they don't, like I said, they don't work on it, then usually you see this, this trend of falling away a lot of times from the church. You see this, uh, this hiatus from the church at times. 
So the biggest statistic, I'm bringing you guys statistics now. So the biggest statistic that all churches see, this is just broad over all churches, and the one that we have to fight is that 70% of young adults stop or take a break from church by the time they turn 23. That's a really, really bad number. That is astronomically high. So within that range, the biggest drop out of, of, of people attending church happens between the ages of 17 to 19. So when you first see teens a lot of times getting their first sense of, of independence, they have their own cars, they can hang out, go hang out with friends all they want, and then when they also go off to college, that's when you see that biggest age dropout. And the study that I'm personally using uh, with these statistics uses teens who attended regularly for at least a year in high school. So it's not all teens, but it's a, 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 a committed group of teens. So the sample, is, like I said, is not necessarily representative of everybody, but it clearly shows us that something is happening at this age range, something that we all could work on. And I believe that in most cases, this survey shows a lack of intentionality. It shows lack of ownership, of responsibility in our walk of faith. So they're dropping out this time when they have, like I said, their first real taste of independence. Now, within the 70%, 80% of them who drop out talk about how they really didn't do it necessarily on purpose. They kind of just became disconnected. A lot of this, like I said, comes at a time of independence when they're going off to college. They're disconnected from their home churches. So become disconnected, and it's not necessarily that they reject the church, their most teenagers aren't primarily leaving because they have significant disagreements with their theological upbringing or out of some sense of rebellion. That's not why 80% of the 70% are leaving. They're leaving because of this disconnection between them and the church when they leave. So we see here again that when they move on, they don't necessarily set priority on finding a new church home. And I saw this a lot as a resident director. Kids that would come, like I said, be strong in their, in their youth groups, and they would come to college, and they wouldn't know where they wanted to go to church. And so for a few weeks, they would travel to different churches, and then next thing you know, they skipped a week, Next thing you know, they skipped another week and another week. And then they're not really going to church anymore. They, they, got, they became disconnected, and they didn't take any priority or ownership of their spiritual walk with God to really find a church to become committed to. So what are some things that have appeared to work for keeping people close to God or at least have gotten them to come back after their time of lapse. Like I said, a lot of these have also come back after an extended period of time, but how can we keep them there or at least have them return? So according to these findings, there are four factors that were the most predictive and determining whether someone would return to the church or stay with the church. Number four being the effectiveness of ministers in their lessons, and their sermons, if they really made them applicable to the teens, to the college students, to their lives, if they made it so that they could literally take what they just heard and apply it some way to their lives. Not something watered down that really doesn't mean anything, but something that they can take right then and there and apply it. So that was number four, the effectiveness of ministers, sermons, and lessons, and if they were relevant 
to the teen's life. The third is, at least one adult from the church made a significant investment in them personally and spiritually. This one speaks astronomically to me. Uh, Like I said, I have many parents here at this church who played a major role in my life. So even if my parents hadn't been great spiritual parents for me, I still had other parents here at this church that would have made a huge difference in my life and my reasoning for for coming back and being a part of the church and being invested. So number three, at least one adult from church made a significant investment in them personally and spiritually. The second was that their parents were first still married and secondly, they both attended church still. As a youth and family ministry major, I have seen how important this is for both parents to stay committed to each other provides such a great example for our kids, especially as they move on in lives, but also that they stayed committed to the church. They show their teens, they show their kids what is the most important thing in life, and we all know that's God. So when you stay committed to getting your kids to church, when you stay faithful to each other, you're setting up your kids be way more likely to stay at at church also. You're raising that statistical analysis astronomically. And the number one thing was that the student themselves wanted the church to help guide their decisions in everyday life. They themselves wanted to take the responsibility of their faith to become a better disciple of Christ. They wanted to take that responsibility of their faith to stay committed to God, to stay committed to their walk of faith with God. So when our teens are able to see an active, practiced faith in their parents, in people of the church, the ones that have really affected their lives, and their ministers, and within themselves, that this likelihood of them developing their own faith is increased. This likelihood, if if parents are committed to each other and committed to the church, if they have people at the church that are committed to them also in their spirituality, if the ministers are committed to giving them something relevant that they can really use, then most teens are more likely to work on their faith themselves. When we are able to make biblical teaching relevant and our teens can see the church as essential to their decisions, when teens have a home with committed Christian parents, which also according to this study, 74% of married couples who are also uh, evangelical in in their beliefs, their children end up being evangelical. Parents, especially parents that are together, make a a significant statistical impact. Also, when we recognize that it doesn't just take parents, it doesn't just take ministers, but it truly takes an entire church to raise a committed young adult, when others get involved in the discipleship process, this is when a difference in our teens can really be made. This is when we will see their commitment, their sense of, of when they want to be fully committed to God, that's when we will see that increase. When so many people on, are involved in the process of growing a disciple, it makes a huge difference in the learning process for them and encourages, it encourages everyone 
in their pursuit of a walk of faith with Christ. It helps our teens to begin and work on a faith of their own. It helps their parents also have the example of someone showing their kids, oh, this is how you begin your relationship with God. And they can better influence their kids. This is a true family where you learn from one another to raise a child to become a disciple. Everybody benefiting each other and not really selfish deeds. So, I have a few challenges for the three groups of people I, I talked about. First one's for the teens. James, chapter 1, verses 22 to 24. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever intently, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. These verses, to me, scream about ownership, scream of, of becoming committed to your faith and your walk with God to do as the Bible says. Many of you, as you grow older, I hope you do begin to develop your own faith, of course, to learn from what you have been taught from Scripture, from your parents, from your mentors, from your ministers, from what you study and what you read because you have a desire to grow in your relationship with God and your desire to do His will. Parents, your challenge comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, six verse 6 and 7. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Be the example that your kids need. Show them how the number one thing in your life is God. No matter how tired or worn out you may be from work, Show them that the most important thing is to get to church. The most important thing is to learn more about God. The more that you can show them true discipleship, the more they will learn from that in your example. When you show them that God comes before school, when God comes before sports, when God comes before social activities, concerts, outings. When you show them that God is more important than all these things, you are setting the ultimate example for your child. Church family, you of course have a challenge too. Psalm 145 verse 4 reads that one generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. We are to take our children under, under our wing. We're to help the parents in raising their children. We're to show them the importance, the order of importance that we just talked about. Help them realize how important it is for them to begin to develop a faith of their own so no one else can take them off their path. 
And to me, this all falls under Proverbs 27, 17. Very, very popular passage. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And it's not just about ourselves becoming sharper. It's about helping others become sharper, helping others become better Christians as well. Becoming and remaining a strong Christian, for that to take real seed, when we make the decision to be intentional about our faith, when we take ownership that our walk with God falls on us and our actions to become closer with Him, when we see that we can truly make a difference in not only our walk, but everybody, walk, everybody else's walk around us, that we can give our children in the church a better chance of staying close to God and a better chance of becoming disciples of God if we ourselves are also drawing closer to God. We must take it upon ourselves to be that example for our teens and for our families. If you want to become a better disciple of Christ, we have to stop assuming that someone else is going to come and make us be a better disciple of Christ. It's not necessarily someone else's responsibility. It's our responsibility in our walk of faith. It's our responsibility in our children's walk of faith to be a strong disciple for Christ. We must take this ownership and responsibility on ourselves. If you are having trouble putting this responsibility on yourself, if you feel like this weight may be too much and you need help, that is exactly what this church family is for. If you want these children to grow up to be disciples of Christ, we have to first start by becoming better disciples ourselves and being the example for them and reaching out to them and showing them what it really means to be that disciple. If you need help with any of these things, please come forward as we stand and sing.